Thank you. For those of you who haven't been to our trustees forums, and I, and I don't know if you have or haven't, but welcome for the first time. We've been doing these for a couple of years. The very first one was um, about California's future. I'm trying to remember the exact title, Looking Forward, Falling Back. Walking backwards. It's amazing, by the way, what has happened in the last couple of years since we did that. A great deal of progress has actually occurred in Sacramento. Um, since then, we've done one on immigration, one on health care, one on technology, and tonight, this very unusual program that we're all going to be part of. The format for us is a little different tonight, too, and as you can see, we've structured it differently. Typically, it would be somebody up here speaking and then a whole room of people um, row by row. And we thought we, that we'd try this. We'd make it a little more, uh, thank you, Cynthia, a little more engaging and informal. And I'm going to introduce uh, Carl and the others who are here. And then we're going to go on, and Carl's going to lead the uh, discussion with those of you in the audience, and then we're going to come back to the panelists. So let me begin by introducing our uh, featured speaker. Carl Lorenz is a professor at the Pardee Rand Graduate School Associate Professor of Medicine at UCLA, palliative, palliative Care Consultant at the VA, and Palliative Care Quality Improvement Resource Center. At RAND, his work includes the development of quality measures for palliative and the end-of-life care, and work for Medi the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission on hospice reimbursement. That must be interesting. Uh, he is a former VA uh, Career Development Awardee and was a Commonwealth Packer Health Policy Fellow in 2007 to 2008. So Carl is going to be our featured speaker, and he's going to come up in just a minute and share some uh, insights, some slides, some other information. Eileen Bunning, sitting over there, is board chair of the Alliance for Living and Dying Well, which is a collaborative of Santa Barbara County organizations concerned with the quality end-of-life care. She has served as president and, C and CEO of Visiting Nurse and Hospice Care of Santa Barbara from 2001 to two 2010. On September 24, 2008, Bunning joined the Santa Barbara Neighborhood Clinic's Board of Directors. She is a registered nurse with a Bachelor of Healthcare Administ Administration and a Master of Arts in Psychology. Uh, she was the Hospice Operations Manager for Sutter Health in San Francisco. Bunning was honored by the Santa Barbara Chamber of Commerce and the Betty Hatch Award for Women and Entrepreneurs. And Betty Hatch is sitting right there. Uh, how's that for uh, serendipity? All right, next is Holly. Holly Gendron That's right next to Fred. Let me just do this. Holly has been a registered nurse for over 40 years with a bachelor's in health care and a master's in public health. She has worked in acute care, critical care, chronic care, and has been with the visiting nurses doing home care and hospice for over 18 years. Holly has worked in many roles at VNHC and currently is the director of Serenity House. End of life care and palliative care has been the primary path and focus for Holly's career for 12 years. Holly has been an educator, quality manager, and direct management in direct management roles for 30 years and enjoys teaching and mentoring new staff in hospice and palliative care. Holly has worked mainly for nonprofit organizations during her career and has been collab collaborating with a palliative and hospice organization in Kenya for nine years, doing site visits, education, and assisting the organization to improve health care access and future sustainability. Elizabeth Wolfson, right there. Elizabeth is chair of the Master's in Clinical Psychology program at Antioch University, Santa Barbara, and has been a licensed practicing psychotherapist for 27 years. She previously served as clinical director in agency settings for over two decades and was an instructor at Columbia University School of Social Work for 10 years. Dr. Wolfson is one of the innovators of the recently established in Santa Barbara, uh, Santa Barbara Village, a community membership organization supporting elders to remain in their homes. She has published and presented on the topic of healthy aging and developed the new concentration here at, at Antioch in healthing, healthy aging with a master's in clinical psychology program. She was awarded the Intergenerational Effort of the Year in 2011 by ARP and the Central, Commission, Central Coast Commission for Seniors. 
In addition to our academic responsibilities, Dr. Wolfson is Vice President of Professional Development on the board of the National Association of Social Workers, and in her spare time, maintains a private practice. You know, I just realized something, Cynthia. I don't have anything for Dr. Cass. That's just, I, it's just fine. So I don't know what happened to it, Fred. I apologize. It didn't come off my computer. I'm a medical oncologist at the Cancer Center. Okay. For those of you who don't know of our famous Dr. Cass, he's a medical oncologist at the Cancer Center. And we're all looking forward to hearing from everybody. And Carl, do you want to start? Are you going to come up here? So I thought I'd call uh, this brief introduction, Living Well to Life's Horizon. Um, and that's because I think end of life care is a very inadequate term for what is useful to think about um, with respect to this challenge. Um, you know, I, um, I think we have uh, end of life care, though, uh, to think about. And the major reason being that Let's see if I'm doing this right. Okay. Okay. Now we're set. Um, that, that so far, it's proven to be um, an intractable issue. And, um, and that's a sad reality. I, I think um, it's a reality that most of us encounter, though, either for ourselves, um, for sure. Um, but uh, often as caregivers of loved ones um, or caregivers and, uh, and, and friends of, of friends um, because this is an inevitable part of life's journey. And I uh, really wanted to make one uh, comment about this. It's, it's not only, only inevitable, but I think it's, it's easy to forget when we think about the disease of the month uh, you know, the yellow or red or purple ribbon we're wearing this week. But um, curing one disease, um, forestalling it, um, it doesn't solve this problem. Um, suffering is a universal issue, and it's, it's not just about the disease. It's not just about how capable we are or what resources we have, because uh, the journey is not just about a, a journey that we experience. It's a journey that we experience in the context of our loved ones and our community. And this photo is meant to capture that, the sadness of the death of a child. It's not just even about our loved ones and about our, our wider community. It's also a passage not just of our biology, but about our existential hope. And so it's impossible to escape the suffering that comes with end-of-life care. Um, but the good news is it's something that we can mitigate. We do know how to do it. It's just that we don't have good access to it. And actually, I would wonder if some of you were facing such situations, if you would know what to do other than um, hospice, which fortunately is a really important resource and one that we've had for some time for dealing with this, but by far is not the only answer to this universal human challenge. So um, on the one hand, it's a journey all of us make. And on the other hand, it's a journey that all of our efforts to cure disease um, cannot alleviate because this is not a journey of biology. It's a journey of us in the community of those we care about. And it's not a journey of our bodies. It's a journey of the spirit. And that raises the issue of, of what we can really hope for. And, uh, you know, what, what is wonderful about this photo. One of my favorite ways to engage this question. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, what, uh, what jumps out at you? Sorry? Positive adjustment. Positive adjustment. That's a great, that's a great phrase. He's pulling her. He's pulling her, yeah. But she's telling him where to go. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. So this is uh, this is probably about as good as it gets. And um, you know, I don't know where that is. It looks like Arizona, but um, but you know, it, uh, it it does communicate a lot of joy. And 
You know, there's some sadness there, too, that we probably don't have access to, right? How two people wind up so impaired and all the struggles that go with that. But this is that kind of balance that we're all looking for, right? Um, because the frailty is increasingly common. And one of, some of the research that's been done, um, some of it published this year, still, some of it's still unpublished, but definitely shows that with longevity probably comes also uh, more disability. And so, um, you know, again, it gets back to the disease of the month problem. It's great not to die of that heart attack, but then you have to live with heart failure, right? Um, it may be great to not go to a nursing home as early when you have dementia, but that means your family has to care for you. So there, these are struggles for which we're seeking an equilibrium. And, and there, is, there is joyful possibility there. Um, you know, hospice is an important and critical part of that answer. It's one that often is applied near the end. Um, these days, we also have services like palliative care. Um, we're going to talk about that in a bit. Um, it's the application of the same principles, but hopefully earlier in the course of illness. Um, and, and this struggle of learning how to do a better job of caring for the whole person is part of what re reallocating dollars from health care to caring needs to be all about. So the first part of, of this brief introduction is just, it's a universal human journey and maybe a reminder of what we might hope for out of it. Um, this is unpublished information um, based on a national, ran a, a national random sample. So this is nationally representative data about what's happened with pain control in the United States for the last decade. I'm not going to dwell on it for a long time right now. I think that there's really interesting information um, uh, that, that would shed further light on this. Overall, we found that pain levels at the end of life have increased year after year for the last decade. Um, that problem seems to be somewhat ameliorated in cancer, but it actually is, is increasing in the entire population, as you can see in the blue line. And one of the interesting things about it is that it does seem to be significantly associated with disability. So this is work we're working to put in the public eye. There's another side to it as well. Um, other unpublished data shows that some of the unmet needs around pain, even if pain levels are increasing, um, may be decreasing. Um, but it's a complex picture. Um, it's not a picture that's entirely clear, part of it because we don't have great information. Um, but uh, this information hides a lot of suffering, and a lot of that suffering is possibly related to living longer with disability. You know, we would care about this if it was a human problem, but we have a societal problem. And this is where it um, really gets interesting and where, you know, we start to get permission to um, kick each other under the table. Um, or if we're in Washington, throw egg on each other's faces. Because this is not a situation we can tolerate. So take home this fact. 5% of Medicare beneficiaries are responsible for 30 to 40 percent of cost. Five percent, right? Who are the five percent? So um, part of them are um, really disabled younger people living with all kinds of problems, many involving substance abuse and mental health disorders. But an entirely different part of that five percent is the frail, sick, and disabled. 30 percent of lifetime Medicare expenditures are expended in the last year of life. And that's true for you, and it's true for Joe, living out on State Street day and night. So the last year of life is the most costly year we face. It's part of the reason why the story of President Obama's um, mother's death in Hawaii, right, or grandmother's death, rather, in Hawaii, right, was, um, was one of the lead-off stories for health care reform, I think. Um, if you remember when she died in Hawaii, and it was, it was sort of acknowledged and discussed a little bit. And I think that um, there was some effort and acknowledgement early in the healthcare reform process to try to answer this question of how do we rein in all of this and what does it do? Now, um, there are several problems with this. One problem is that that overall rate of growth, its contribution to that rate of growth, is largely responsible to, for the fact that at around 2040 or 2050, um, our expenditures on just social welfare, including health, 
and interest on our, um, on our debt will, encount, will encompass every dollar of federal tax revenue that we have. Now, this graph has changed a little bit with sequestration, but all that's done is push it just slightly to the right, right? This, this problem is why the Congressional Budget Office said this year, guess what? The issues aren't solved. And this is the unacknowledged problem. This is the unacknowledged problem in Washington. Solving the health care issue has to go through better end of life care, not around it. <clears throat> and, um, and it would be one thing if the problem were getting better. So it has a human dimension, it has um, a, a social dimension in terms of cost. And um, these two problems go together. This is data from a February publication in JAMA by a, a colleague um, who's also working with us at RAND, but is based at Brown University named Joan Tino. And um, Joan's work in February was uh, fairly widely publicized. Um, I just uh, point you to the fact that both the yellow and the green lines are going up. And, and really, um, it's, it's interesting, the percent of deaths in hospitals has gone down as death from hospice and ICU use has gone up. Can you think of a unifying explanation for why these three things are co-occurring? I'll tell you the reason um, that uh, Jones data supports. The reason is because um, we do get more hospice care at the end but we get it after increasingly aggressive care. So hospice care, although in greater use, is tacked on at the end of a very aggressive and otherwise high cost healthcare um, experience. So it's not that we've shortened the journey, we've just made sure that you get to a slightly different destination, and that destination is called hospice. And this has both a human cost as well as a social cost. So the, the two points we made about care being aggressive, right, about, um, about being, it being costly and high use and, and increased pain for many um, conditions, including the increase in disability, they're not disconnected. We take care of people longer under more aggressive conditions and it's harder. And these things go together. And there's a simple rule, uh, rule that you can think about when you wonder why in the world that occurs. It's called the law of diminishing returns. How many of you would take your car in the seventh time after it blew up and started spewing black smoke, right? If you drive, you know, a Bugatti Veyron, I can understand it, okay? But if you drive a Toyota Tercel, like I have, it's not worth it, right? And I think um, most of us in, in end of life care honestly many times are driving um, the Toyota Tercel um, and taking it to the shop not only the seventh time but the eighth or ninth or tenth time. And it's remunerative from the standpoint of the healthcare system but it has a human cost. And so that's, that's part of the, the dilemma or the rub. And we're going to touch a little bit on what healthcare reform has done but um, you know this kind of says it all. What is healthcare reform really about? It's about extending access. That's part of why it's so infuriating for many people who might not um, share the goal of, of, of redistributing, essentially, um, tax dollars towards a broader population to provide healthcare. Um, but whatever you think of that, it's left the dragon of cost largely unaddressed. We, ha we don't have the tools. Um, we have some interesting tools that might start to make a dent in that, but to a large extent, the cost problem is still there. And this is the quote that kind of started it all with regard to the death panels. This was Sarah Palin's Facebook page. And um, again, whatever you think about it, so we could kind of read it, um, the Democrats promise that a government health care system will reduce the cost of health care. But as the economist Thomas Sowell has pointed out, um, government health care will not reduce the cost, it will simply refuse to pay the cost. And who will suffer the most when they ration care? The sick, the elderly, and the disabled, of course. The America I know and love is not one in which my parents or my baby with Down syndrome will have to stand in front of Obama's death panel so his bureaucrats can decide, based on a subjective judgment of their level of productivity in society, whether they're worthy of health care. An inflammatory and uh, incisively targeted comment. Um, in fact, um, death, death and dying are two of the biggest cost drivers. Um, 
And um, they're one of the most humanly resonant, um, I think, uh, challenges we face. And so, um, so we'll talk about this comment, but it had a very chilling effect on efforts to incorporate or address these issues in the context of healthcare reform. In fact, previously bipartisan legislation on improving advanced care planning and making, a, making it a routine part of the healthcare visit in Medicare died immediately after this comment. Um, and so, uh, so there were bipartisan efforts to improve end-of-life care in the context of health care reform. They disappeared after this. So I'm going to stop here because I think this kind of says it all. When I think of, of where we are, um, this is uh, a patient I had <coughs> about 10 years ago. And he represents a problem that's still a problem. He was a cancer patient with head and neck cancer, a former Black Panther. And he came to see me after seeing his surgeons. Here's what his surgeon said. Head and neck cancer is in excruciating pain. And they said, well, you know, we'd like you to come back um, in a couple of weeks for further surgical consultation. We've got a couple of tests for you to get. And he said, I feel horrible. I feel, I feel terrible. I'm having terrible pain. And they said, um, all right, well, uh, we want you to go see your primary care doctor about that, and we'll see you back in two weeks after your CT scan. So he came to see me for the first time about a week later with this picture in hand. And, um, and at the bottom of this, he actually said, I, I bet if I was black, I, I bet if I wasn't black, I would have gotten better care. Um, he was an African-American veteran who was formerly a Black Panther. And, uh, um, and he donated his last $200 to our hospice program. Um, but, you know, he didn't get the right care for his head and neck cancer, and, um, and part of the reason was that he didn't have anyone to address his pain. He didn't want doctors who didn't care for him as a person to be caring for a bunch of cells in his neck. And consequently, his care wasn't as good as it should have been, and he had more suffering, which made a big impact on him before he came to see us. So I think um, those problems are still pervasive. And they, they may seem like past history, but if, uh, if you have head and neck cancer, you'll discover that there's still current events. Um, but I think that's the question we have today, is what we should be thinking about that, and um, what we can learn and what actions we can take. And I think there are significant answers to that. So um, maybe we'll just stop here before we get started and see what questions are on people's minds as we think about the kind of conversation we want to have as a group. Supposed to be passing this mic, but I want to know what you did for this guy. Well, I started him on opioid therapy, and he became relatively pain-free. And then we had extensive conversations repeatedly over several months. Um, I was trying to urge him to go and under, undergo surgical therapy, but he had so lost the trust, or the, or the physicians who took care of him initially were going to be responsible for his cancer excision, and so lost his trust that he wasn't willing to go back. And so he made a choice not to undergo surgical therapy. And, you know, um, that uh, bothered me a lot. But um, he made choices. He was a very strong-willed man, very brilliant uh, man, um, and an artist. He, uh, he had a whole book of drawings like this about his experiences that were really fantastic. But, um, but he made his choices, and we did our best to facilitate his care and his choices, even when they weren't the ones we would have made ourselves or made for people we love. And so... Um, so he died uh, probably a year, 18 months later. He was very comfortable, um, and, he, and that was the ultimate choice he made. Yeah. I'm just curious about sustaining life and how that relates to overpopulation in the future. And, and obviously the cost, is that you mentioned the last week, the last month of life being so expensive for everyone who's going to hang around. Mm. Okay. It just strikes me that so much of this is so deeply rooted in our culture, it's not part of the health care system or medical system. Even your comment, and this is not a criticism, but that this gentleman's decision to not go to surgery bothered you. Well, so often our families say, no, 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 that's not an option. And, and thus the expenses mount and the qualities. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's so much of it is outside the system of care. Yeah. And I, I don't know how you address it. So it's a broader cultural problem, is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I went to a longevity conference uh, a few years ago, and uh, the 
doctors and experts were saying, this may be the last generation that dies of natural causes. And I said, well, does that mean that we can't die if we want to? <laughs> want to? <laughs> sure. Yes. Uh, Is there any way to depoliticize this question so that it, it, it is not put in terms of entitlement versus taxation mm -hmm. and uh, where one side feels it wins and one side feels it loses? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So maybe I'd tie that. And is somebody taking, can, one, can our panel take notes so that we don't miss these um, questions? So I'm going to tie two questions together. So we had a question about to what extent is it an issue of culture? And then we have a question about sort of where is the political equilibrium? Does it really have to be a battle? And I think that ties very closely to the issue of, of culture. And in fact, we have an expert on community engagement. I think that that ties very closely to the issue of um, how we take action as communities to think about this problem. So, um, so let's not lose a, that thread. Uh, uh, oh, I was just going to add on uh, that I'll pass this over, uh, but okay. I wanted to uh, ask if you could talk about um, uh, self deliverance, I think is the term, but the challenges both for doctors, mm -hmm. nurses, psychologists, <laughs> healthcare, you know, hospice people. When someone says, I really want to make the choice and I want to have take my own course of action. And do you mean to end their life? Yes, to okay. end their lives. Okay. Um, okay. Yes, one of the comments that I remember from your comments was that the longer you live, the more apt you are ex to experience more and more pain. I remember very clearly my mother died at age 85, congestive heart failure, and she talked about the pain. Every cell in her body hurt. I, my question is, perhaps for the panel, talk about, if you will, the advances in the management of pain. That's a, that's a great you. comment. We certainly will address that. Um, it seems like one of the underlying assumptions of the medical uh, system is that uh, death is to be feared, and, and it's an enemy that must be fought off at all costs. And I'm wondering, is there, are there any uh, policies or programs or ideas that are being diffused through the uh, medical education system mm -hmm. so that doctors and nurses and so on can provide counsel about what death really is, which, mm -hmm. as you point out, is 100% certain yeah. to win win in the end, and, right. and rather than having a fear-based mm. um, uh, attitude towards it, we, we could accept it more. Okay. So, um, so what are trends in healthcare education that might mitigate this kind of an issue? Yes. Um, one of the things that I'm noticing is uh, in the past decade or so, as friends turn 60, was the issue of just the denial of death, mm -hmm. and how many of my friends, sophisticated in most ways, haven't even dealt with wills or discussions with family members mm -hmm. or any of this. There seems to be such a resistance that will hit those of us who have that attitude at the moment when we become ill and sure. further exacerbate a very tough situation. Mm -hmm. So I'm just talking, I'm speaking to that issue of yeah. culture right. from the standpoint of that, the enormity of that in our culture. Okay. Um, so I don't want to neglect any of the questions. Let's just summarize maybe some things. So one, uh, one issue we already had on our question set was um, opioids and analgesics. So uh, that kind of deals with pain management. We'll, so we'll talk about that. I think we had a couple questions about culture and, um, and culture and politics too, which, which is very much related to culture. So we'll um, that's a, also on our agenda as, as one of our questions. And then I also heard um, more about this reluctance. It it's, touches on culture, but maybe the specific issue of our reluctance to address death and dying, how we deal with that as individuals, um, maybe death denying, um, and, um, and also medical education. So um, maybe we could talk a little bit about the issue of futility or, um, you know, what does it mean to extend life? So maybe we could talk about 
how about, how about that? We have a lot to deal with. So I thought maybe it would be useful, first of all, to think about what we want out of it, right? What's, what is it, um, what do people need? And, and this is something I think our panel can address, and I think, you know, you guys can figure it out. You, we all know this, right, as human beings, but, but what do we need? What is, um, what do we fear the most when we're facing um, that kind of an illness, and, and what do we hope for? What can we hope for? So maybe we could start there. What, uh, what would be, what, what do you think? I don't, and I think we're all experts at this. Just speak up. I, you know, just say it. I'd like to say something. Oh, yes, please. I'd like to congratulate everybody for being in this room because I think what we fear is the very topic that we're here to talk about which is our aging, the decline of our bodies, and our inevitable death. And what we need is to recognize that it's inevitable, to embrace it. And if we each do that individually, and if it permeates through our systems, our educational systems, our medical systems, our political systems, then we as a culture can begin to embrace what is absolutely going to happen. It's the one thing we know for sure. And then we can approach it in a way that we are activists and do something as we move forward in that direction. So, so I think that's really a response to what you're asking. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so maybe people could just speak up, just say things. What about heaven? <laughs> what about heaven? <laughs> okay. Yeah, and spiritual uh, involvement. Okay. So um, I, I think. Uh, let me just say spiritual, yeah, the question of heaven maybe, and, and um, I, maybe there are different ways people would think about that, but, um, but certainly um, our spiritual well-being, what does that mean? What does that mean? I've had lots of illnesses in the past five years, some of them quite serious, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that I would not be alive today if it weren't for this guy sitting beside me. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what kept me alive. Mm. And I was never afraid of dying. Mm -hmm. So I would say that if you all have a stand, it's good. OK, all right. So um, that's, a, that's a wonderful testimony. It's really touching. And I, 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 but I think, you know, let me try to put these in categories. I, I think we worry about the spirit. We worry about those who love us when we're ill, for sure. Yes. A point of um, quality of life, and I can't define that for you, Betty, but you can define it for yourself. And it sounds like one of the big qualities in your life is your relationships. Uh, the biggest, okay. <laughs> and um, if we could clone Stan, we'd have this solved, right? <laughs> However, um, we have to grapple with that ourselves. Um, what would my quality of life be? What is my quality of life today? What will it be in five years and 10 years? You know, I'm 69 and beginning to have knee pain, joint pain. I can't walk, I no longer run, but I now do aerobics in the water, so I'm learning to adapt. But what is my quality of life and what would I wish for myself? And, and I'm gonna share a really quick personal snippet um, my husband had a massive coronary and lived for 10 more years after that, but he lived with an a implanted defibrillator and a pacemaker and gradually began to decline and said to myself and to his cardiologist and to his internist, I don't want to go back into the medical intensive care unit anymore. That's not a quality of life for me. He had his advanced care directives completed we worked a little bit harder with the cardiologist than we had to with the internist, but they honored his wishes because he was so clear about what his quality of life was going to be. And he died at home with 14 grandkids around and um, listening to his favorite operas. So it doesn't have to be a big, bad, ugly scene. Hard emotionally, it was very, very sad, but he knew he was so clear on what his quality of life would be. something that uh, made me think that we grapple with these decisions when we're faced with the terminal illness, but I don't believe that that needs to happen. 
I think we can advance care plan and make our decisions long before it becomes of, of an emotional decision fraught with your loved ones, your family, who can't now fathom to see you struggling with a disease and pain and all the other issues that go with, do I treat, do I not, what do I do? There's, an, you know, there's a way to become, you know, to have those decisions made when you don't, it's not fear-based and, and, and you can, your family can be on board, your loved ones can be understanding and you connect with them and make that workable instead of when it is so far into the um, trajectory of your illness that you are frightened and nobody can decide whether or not one more course of chemo or one more surgery can extend your life. You've made that decision early enough on in your life before illness. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, you asked what we uh, want or what we need, mm -hmm. and I'd like to just drop this pebble into the water okay. uh, that we need to embrace the story of death and dying into the multi-generational uh, population that marginalizing the dying uh, diminishes our entire society. I love your sentiment that we should decide early on what we're going to do. And my husband and I were very, very mature about deciding early on when he found that he had leukemia. And um, when he was in the hospital having a bone marrow transplant, we knew exactly where he, what we had decided. We had it in D, you know, do not resuscitate. Our doctors knew, the hospital knew. And then came the moment in time when his heart was going and his, or his kidneys were going. And they said to me, as I stood with my family, if you don't allow us to intubate him now, he will die, and you should give him a chance. And I will tell you, this is at a big hospital in LA, and I stood there in the worst possible state, loving my husband more than I can tell you, <clears throat> and knowing what we wanted, and knowing that I could not be the one to say you're dead. So. I, I understand what you're saying. We all know what we want, but then when we get there and the doctors are, are so, uh, their desire is for him to live. I, it's not like it, I see them as enemies. They aren't enemies. But we're all so confused because nobody wants death. My husband was okay with death. I will tell you that before he died, he said, you know, he said, I've done the work on this earth that I was put here to do. The only reason I want to stay, really stay, is because of you. But I've been here. I've done what I needed to do. We were, hap we were okay with the idea. And then I was lost. And now, of course, I often think back to that moment. Um, my doctors, in the end, helped him die. And they do that all over the hospitals there. Doctors will help your loved ones die when it's finally they know it's too late. This was a, a terrible situation. I think it happens because we're so, uh, we don't have a good feeling about death. We don't make peace with it. We don't, we don't know that it's the end of pain. We don't mm -hmm. think that it's before we were born. That's what mm -hmm. it feels like. We're mm -hmm. so frightened of it. And the, and the sad truth is that none of us are responsible for death. Death occurs whether we want it or not, and we never want it, and so, um, uh, when we're working with families, and I might ask Dr. Cass what he thinks about this, but um, you know, I think we have a professional role, and we have a, and we have to, we can't ignore our human role, and our human role is to um, to acknowledge that it's not a responsibility we should put on our own shoulders, um, but we do have a responsibility to comfort, and that's one um, in that circumstance that we often advocate. I think, first of all, I think some of the Issues in medicine are generational. Um, I think the next generation of doctors will have a different view of this than the last generation of doctors. I mean, it's true of a lot of things, and it's true of, of us as well. And so I and and I think whether whether it's really education that's changing. I wish that I thought education was changing. I'm actually not sure that's the reason. I think that doctors are simply part of the fabric of the families from whom they come, and and there's just. 
they're, they reflect the, the, you know, the changing culture, so they're more sensitive. I think there was a generation of doctors for whom death was professional failure. And, it, and when I went to medical school, there were a lot of discussions about how to define success and failure. And there was a um, huge weight a lot of doctors took upon themselves and thought that losing a patient meant that they did something wrong, that what they were supposed to be doing, they obviously didn't do well enough. Um, but I think, we're get, I think we're getting past that. We are the, um, the internet is our enemy a little bit. Um, um, there's, uh, for those of us who practice on, you know, one of the great things about cancer research, one of the things that really keeps me involved in cancer research is that, uh, well, if you like science and you like to see people inventing and developing cool things, cancer research is a, is a great thing to be involved in. And those, those who do it are quite proud of the advances that they make. And it's human nature that, um, you know, if we make a new soft drink in our kitchen, we think we're the new Coca-Cola. And so if you have a little lab and, you, and, and a mouse lives longer than you expected the mouse to live, you're sure that you found the secret to curing things. But these things make it on the internet, and so when someone is, is diagnosed with whatever, and they, like, like you and your husband, may have come to terms with their own mortality a long time ago, but their children come in with internet searches, maybe it doesn't break out this generationally all the time, but I can tell you it's pretty common that uh, I'll have this conversation with parents and then I'll get a frantic call from son in, in Minnesota who's done this internet search and just knows that there's this uh, vaccine that's being developed in Florida and obviously dad needs to get to Florida. You know, I think, I think it's, you know, we live in a culture where um, we expect to fix things. And so part of the issue is how do we, um, how do physicians advance themselves? Um, how, do, how do patients take on the responsibility? And then how do we resist the temptation to see, um, to see f fixable problems around the corner? So, so I just want to bring us back before we move on to, our, to the question and just think about whether we answered it before, because I think this is taking us in another direction, which we also intend to go. Um, but so I heard. Various themes come out in the comments so far. Existential um, uh, care, anxiety, fear, um, planning for the future, uh, pain, and, and so symptom management, um, the, the care of our families, not just ourselves, a community. Um, is there anything that we missed? I just want to add yes. The, the education, because I, I really see that as so pivotal, and with all due respect to the physicians in the room, they need to learn from human services and the human services need to learn from the physicians that we work together and that fixing something is not necessarily about saving a life and it's mostly about helping people process whatever is happening to accept the realities that we know to be true to be able to move into them in a way that is empowering and healthy and, and our healthy aging program is part of that because we're really looking at preventative and um, it, a positive approach to what we know is inevitably going to happen, which is our aging and our death. And if we can dovetail all of that, we learn from each other. You know, I'm, I, I work with couples all the time, and um, what I teach my students about that is you're not there to save the marriage. You're there to look at how you can save each individual's quality of life and if you save the marriage along the way, then everything's good. But sometimes the quality of life is not about responding to the problem at hand. And I think if we look at that analogy, it really speaks to what you're saying, Dr. Cass, that um, we can really, really help people through education, educating ourselves and human services and medical profession, educating one another. So. Absolutely. Um, so uh, let me just, so quality of life, these particular issues, yes? The word control has been mentioned. Control. Talk, talk, talk to that. Tell me what you mean. Okay. That a person still has control over their life mm -hmm. and 
by extension their death? Uh -huh. And at what point in this system do you lose that control mm -hmm. and how can you uh, prevent losing that control? Mm -hmm. And where would you have to go? What country, what state, et cetera? Where would you have to go if you wanted to maintain a better sense of control so that's a, over your life and your death? Yeah, that's a great question and I think we should acknowledge it. We might connect it to the question about assisted dying. And I think the reason that we might do that is that um, having a need for control is one of the most common associations with requesting assistance in dying. It's because, because dying is the ultimate loss of control, right? And aging is about losing control. What's interesting is that those who feel most threatened by lo loss of control, of course, are the most capable and affluent members of society. Actually, those who've never had control seem to be those who don't actually um, ask much for this right or privilege um, in approaching the end of life. So it's just an interesting observation. It's a fact. Um, you can read it when you think about who makes these kinds of requests in the state of Oregon. Um, there was a question earlier about, you know, what happens when, uh, how do we deal with these kinds of requests? And, you know, um, there's really interesting observation. Um, Ezekiel Emanuel is a, um, was head of the NIH Institute for Bioethics and um, also is very involved at the Obama White House in healthcare reform. But um, anyway, uh, Zeke is an oncologist. Um, and some of the interesting work he did over a decade ago was on the fact that most requests for dying are transient. And what are they associated with? Um, with feelings of sadness, with depression, with despair. Um, you know, as clinicians, um, when we evaluate people who are making those requests, the, it's, it's an important thing, I think, to think about what suffering means. A request for dying is about suffering. And for many, it's, it's about the issue of control. So what can we do? Maybe I'll just pose that as a question instead of trying to answer it. I can tell you how we may deal with it. And I think um, some of our folks at the table who um, have thought about this and have dealt with patients can also give you an answer. But what do you think? Besides giving you medicine, what should we do? What would you want a clinician to do? Um the point about control is great, and, and I went, a year ago, I was diagnosed with a very aggressive lymphoma that was in mm -hmm. my central nervous system, yes. and things moved really quickly. All of a sudden, <coughs> I couldn't swallow, I couldn't see, I yes. couldn't walk in the space of about yeah. three weeks. And there wow. develops, you know, we, we had talked about end of life, we had directives, we had all these things, yep. but there's a fog of war yep. that occurs when you get sick all of a sudden and yes. you get very sick and it's very difficult to sort things out yep. so i was hospitalized for uh six months for a very aggressive uh, course of chemotherapy and after the first I, I was so sick and i had so little quality of life between the illness and the chemotherapy that i i wanted to go home i said let's go home and have palliative care and then my stand my wife said no you know we can still you yeah. can still do this. You need to yeah. do this. You need to finish. Just finish this course for me. Yeah. And it was very difficult because, mm -hmm. you know, I know what I felt, and I know what I felt physically and mm -hmm. spiritually, and, yeah. and she knew what she felt. And yeah. there was no one in the hospital, there was no one in that setting mm -hmm. who was a kind of counselor who could help us talk through those issues. And obviously, we, we got through them. Yeah. Um, but but it was that nowhere was there any any kind of service or resource or person yeah. who could help mediate that or help yeah. help us really understand that. Mm. Well, I just maybe make an observation and then turn it over to our panel too to reflect on this. But you know, you said something really important. One is the role of your wife in helping you with that, and that it's one of the tensions we have, I think, in thinking about this problem um, in oncology. I think. Um, it's easy to know that we did the right or the wrong thing after the fact. It's sometimes really hard in advance. Um, and that's why many times it should be about our goals and our values and our experience and not about the numbers because, um, because uh, I think maybe we have certain thresholds for decision making and we can think about what those are, but, um, but these are not easy decisions. And, and then the other thing is that um, when things don't go well, sometimes the challenge is giving one another permission. And one of the things we do in hospice care, palliative care, is we think about 
about how we help our loved ones with the last part of their journey and to facilitate the preferences that they have. We always keep the patient at the center of that journey because it's not about us. And, and when those times come, it's not about the guilt of us causing their dying. It's about us taking responsibility to help them and to, and to make the most positives out of what, excuse me, out of um, what otherwise is inevitably um, also a terrible negative and a terrible, a terrible sadness. So, um, but, I, but those are really important things that you, you kind of brought out in your story. I think the really, you know, one of the best, most wonderful parts about that story is you're here, right? I mean, we love the she fact, was right? Right, yeah, yeah. And, I, and, I, and that's part, of, I, I, you know, and, and that's, that's part of the dilemma. I mean, that's really the heart of the dilemma because, in fact, um, I mean, I, you know, one of the things I, you know, one of the things we all love about life is miracles actually, you know, do happen, right? And, um, and so when patients come or families come and say, we believe this is a, you know, miracle is going to happen, you know, it may be, you know, part of our training in, in, in helping families adjust to death and dying may be to, to try to, we don't want to do, not so much discount that as much as put it in the context of the, of the odds, but in fact, the most wonderful things about us as humans is we do like pull off like really miraculous things. And that is the heart of the um, dilemma. It's, it's a, it, it, it makes everything that we do harder and all the decision making harder, but you know, it's a kind of cool thing about who we are. <laughs> It's also more typical, of course, you know, of cancer, and I think it's less typical of, say, an elderly relative with dementia. And so that's a harder counterpoint to think about. Um, but uh, let's go back to the question of control, and what do we do about control at the end of life? I don't know, Elizabeth, do you want to? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. <laughs> I just wanted to, yeah. I was a family therapist yes. in St. Louis, not here, mm -hmm. and my specialty was dealing with death and dying. Okay. and. And I came out of a hospital setting. And to you, I would say, in most hospitals, there is a social service department. Unfortunately, usually the so social service department is referred to by doctors when people have financial problems. Mm -hmm. The truth of it is that all of us are really well trained to do the kinds of things that you need. One of the reasons I left the hospital and then got referrals from doctors was so that I could work with the family to discuss all of these issues um, early in the diagnosis, hopefully. And one of the first things that I would say to my patient, my client who was the diagnosee, was that he or she and I were the only ones in that room that knew she or he was dying. And, but once that came out and once we could talk and really go through that process, those end of life issues were so much easier. But I do think there's a lot of available services. Again, sometimes it's an issue of finances, uh, but most of us have great sliding scales. And, um, but I do think if we can talk about it with our families, and that's all of it to the very end and to um, uh, and making the choice and having control to end your own life. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, they are there. For sure. Um, so my, my husband always believed that when his mother died, that she died um, because she just decided to leave, mm -hmm. even though she was completely healthy, but she couldn't take care of herself anymore, so she went into assisted living. And a few days later, she died. Mm -hmm. Um, when I went to clean out her uh, apartment, I discovered a, um, a packet from the Hemlock Society. Mm -hmm. And um, she had just made a choice yeah. that it was better mm -hmm. to go at that time. So there's, there's that. Yep. Yeah, no, there is. And, um, yes. I just want to dovetail on this because it's why I'm here, actually, and wanted us to do the symposium. Several years ago, one of my closest friends told me that her husband had decided to take his life, that, that his medical condition had been going downhill and he knew it wasn't going to get any better and he wanted to have control at the end. And so 
they spent the uh, last six or eight months going to visit their children and telling them so that they wouldn't be surprised, which was a very responsible thing to do. And she supported him in this decision. And then the day came that, he, uh, that they had appointed, they'd put it on the calendar, and she called me in the afternoon and she said, I can't be alone while he goes through this. Will you come and sit with me? And I was really torn because on one hand, I thought how lonely it would be for her to have the scotch and soda with him, clink glasses, and he goes in the other room and takes the pills. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I thought, what, I could get in a lot of trouble. And um, <coughs> I went, mm -hmm. <laughs> because relationships are more important than somehow getting in trouble. Mm. Uh, and the biggest challenge was he took all the pills and he didn't die. Okay. And then the doctor mm -hmm. at two in the morning, we called and said, what are we gonna do? And he said, if you come to my office, I will give you the morphine and mm -hmm. you can take it home, but I can't come myself. And so his wife went and got the morphine injection it was one of the hardest days of my life, and yet, um, so anyway, I'm here because mm. I've still wondered if I did the right thing. Mm. You know, it's, it haunts me a little bit, and so I'm just sharing that. But yeah. it's a lonely thing, and, and also an incredibly, incredibly intimate mm. moment. Mm. It's, it's, in a way, the greatest gift a friend can give. Yeah. So. Well, um, you know, I, I so, these are really amazing stories. Um, I think maybe we want to circle around to where we started with them. And, you know, one of the questions is, you know, how do we handle these sorts of requests? And they're not uncommon. Um, and loss of our sense of control is, is universal, I think, when we're dying. So um, maybe, um, I don't know, what do our panelists do Doctor, could I just yes. throw one more thing in okay. there? I, Jerry asked this w w terrific question about nobody was there to mediate, and mm -hmm. I maybe you people could talk about. Uh, he was in one of the best hospitals in the in the state, <coughs> probably one of the best hospitals in the country. Mm -hmm. Isn't there something that can be done that Jerry and his wife would have had somebody there to mediate? I mean, so practical. Yeah. I mean, so let's talk about that. I I could throw in my two cents, but I'm going to hold off on saying anything and let the rest of the panel address. What are the what, how do we give people control back? And what are the, um, do, when, when patients make this request, is our only option to send them off to a dark room on their own? And, and how, do you, how do you handle that? So. Yeah, I'll take a start. I, I, I want to call on the other panel members here. Um, one thing that I want to congratulate this community for doing, and it was a community effort, was to make the decision that yes, hospice is great, but hospice wasn't reaching people sometimes where they needed to be reached. And um, between some of the commitment of the physicians, the visiting nurse and hospice care, the cancer center, cottage hospital, they began a very um, aggressive palliative care group. And they didn't just address the medical issues. They brought in gifted chaplains, social workers, nurses, and several physicians, not just one physician. And that core group was so successful within the cottage umbrella of being called 24 hours a day to families that had dilemmas in facing hard decisions or choices, um, but it also was extended to outpatient. And um, I have to say I haven't been a def definitive part for the last couple of years, so I'm not sure what the action is now. Community, the, the palliative care team will go into homes and visit and start as soon as somebody requests that service. And yeah. they do skilled nursing facilities, they have clinic at um, the cancer center, and the hospital program is still very robust. And, um, and how, they, how does someone in the community know about your the existence? Physicians in this community are, and you know, they started in the hospital, but the physicians became aware and became educated 
became part of, you know, seeing that it was truly a, um, a valued program that helped folks like Jerry, Jerry, um, to deal with and to understand, to educate and to, to give you the resources and, and to find ways and to listen. And to, um, and sometimes that's how we give people back a little yeah. bit of control. It doesn't have to be control about every, it doesn't have to be control about every decision. It's, it can be, give you a little bit of, a little bit of a decision and the next decision and you all make these decisions together. But it's about listening and understanding and grieving with people and, um, and accepting and bringing, bringing loved ones together, and the teams do that really well. The palliative care teams, the physicians, bringing team, bringing loved ones together, so that there's a, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole team around the patient that, um, that get support, so they get supported and comforted, and you know it's the loved ones that are left behind that it's the hardest for it. It isn't. Usually, the patient who's left behind that it's that it's hard. F I mean, that leaves us that is hard for, but it's the loved ones. Yeah. So, bringing everybody together in the palliative care team and the hospice teams, who are interdisciplinary, are the ones that do it with great skill and um, emotion yeah. and gifts that bring these people yeah. what they need. Yeah, I have to say, from my perspective, it's been important to participate in the conversation because we're talking about it as a societal, or cultural, or national one. Um, but from a very provincial standpoint, um, this has been an extraordinary community in which to be involved between a visiting nurse and hospice and Serenity House and um, the uh, wellness program, we call wellness program, which includes a lot of social services, a lot of support. If you're a patient, at least in oncology, I can speak for, if you're a patient in oncology, um, uh, you're going to have to kind of fight us off if you don't want to spend time in social services or with a patient navigator or with a counselor or with a case manager. I mean, you're just going to have to make a big effort to run in, see your doctor, and run out. <laughs> Um, yeah, we don't do that if, <laughs> if you're really trying to avoid that kind of support. I mean, we're, we're just quite blessed, the community. And, and Mo, to be honest, I think that um, we, I mean, this, the fact that this forum exists and the fact that you're all here is actually the reason why this happens because, um, I mean, you guys, we have like some extraordinarily talented people that have put together Visiting Nurse and Hospice and Serenity House. And if you haven't seen it, you have to go. And if you haven't seen the new VNA facilities, you have to go. And what you guys have pulled off in rescuing the neighborhood health clinics is just extraordinary. There's just a lot of extraordinary people in town that have done amazing things for the community. But the fact of the matter is that it works uh, mostly because of you guys right because you only do it because you have a community of people that to be honest will participate in volunteers will sign up for to be on boards will actually buy the things at silent auctions that they have no idea what they're <laughs> going to do with if they win i mean you know that's why we get to do all this stuff and and the fact that you guys all sh you know show up uh for this is um is part and parcel to why it why we're so successful as a community. Well, just um, I'd come at it from the exact opposite place, which is this is this place. This forum is called Living Well to the End, and I would say Living Well to the End is about living well from the beginning. And as coming from the psychological and emotional perspective, I think we can do a lot in terms of working on the end from the very start, communicating all along that, yeah, you're losing control in the end, and guess what? You're losing control every single second of your life. The only thing you know is that everything's going to change, and you have no idea what's next. And if you can't embrace that from day one, I'm talking from the time you learn how to talk, the time you learn how to write and read and think, that we all want everything to be the same, we all want to have control, and guess what? We, none of us, none of us have it. And if you can be open to that and embrace that, 
when you get to the end, you're not going to be afraid that that moment is just like all the others that you've lived, which is knowing you don't know what's next. And, you know, you're going to do it alone. You could have Stan right next to you, but you're going to die alone, you're going to live alone, you're going to get born alone, and those are realities that it's okay to know about if you can be okay with it. So I'd say there's that part of educating all of us and having these conversations where we can really talk about this mm -hmm. and say, okay, let me be open, let me live my life proactively because I, if I know I have no control and I know there's going to be an end, I'm going to live it as fully as possible. So Irvin Yalom said, you know, it's the physicality of death that kills us. <laughs> but the idea of death is what saves us. Okay, the fact that we know we're going to die is what makes life so precious. And so there's so much that can be done along that that, that makes your jobs mm -hmm. at the end so much easier. Because when people get there, they're ready. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just uh, put a little gloss on this. So I'm just going to tell you, um, this happens all the time. We have veterans who, well, I, I provide my care in the VA, and we have veterans who make these requests, and, um, and just like patients and friends do everywhere. And I, I'm going to tell you the most important recognition when you hear that cry is that that's a cry for help frequently. It's a cry for help. It's a cry of suffering. And we have to think about the whole person. And you know, one of the worst parts about being in the hospital, um, I'll tell you, for me, it's just going to completely stink. And that's like not being able to eat what you want. Um, not only that, but people put diapers on you. Yeah. Um, not only that, but they wake you up at 2 in the morning to say, um, your buzzer went off. Do you need anything? Um, or um, roll over. That alarm keeps going off because you're, roll you're, you're lying on that, um, on that electronic lead. Here, let me fix that while you're trying to sleep. So, um, you know, we don't have human health care environments. We don't have responsive health care environments. Um, when, when a person makes that cry for help, we, um, we turn off the alarms. We don't bother them in the middle of the night if they don't want to be bothered. We make sure that their family can bring in the food they want. And if they're diabetic and they want to eat um, cake with 16 inches of frosting on the top, we make sure that we can get it for them. Um, you know, when, uh, when they're um, tired of being bothered by alarms, we turn them off. So a lot of that cry is about humanizing the experience. A lot about the, the value of, the, of that cry is recognizing it as a cry for help. The saddest thing is to not hear the cry for help um, and not be able to respond to it because it is a choice that many people make. And many people make it in silence. But there are, there are ways that we approach that um, along with skilled teams of people not who include physicians but also include nurses and social workers and chaplains and others. And I think the other thing we have to realize is that even if we heed that cry, that is not an answer to the problem of end-of-life care. Because it's very few people who actually are desperate enough to make that cry. Most of us just suffer through it. And the thing to acknowledge is that most of the time, and for most of us, there are answers to the suffering. There are things that we can do that are positive. And so um, knowing that you can go for help and where to go for it is an important uh, um, an important tool to have at your disposal. And a lot of times the words for that these days are hospice, palliative care, um, there um, may be a skilled therapist or somebody who might be an independent practitioner um, working on aging issues who can be a guide to a family um, over time. But there are people who have those skills. Sadly, they're not widely enough available they're not widely enough known. And we don't talk about this so that we know what to do. So we suffer in silence. Um, but there's an answer. Yes. Uh, difficult process under any circumstances. However, it, is. it gets even worse given the fact <coughs> that if you finally make the decision and want to make the decision to control <coughs> your life, yeah. and that is to control your death, sure. that it's an illegal act. It's and I think an illegal act. An illegal act. Okay. That what, what should happen mm -hmm. and what help with this whole process yeah. is for us to decriminalize death. Mm -hmm. okay. And it's, be, it's, it's we're, we're way beyond the time that that should have occurred. Yeah. We have a lot of religious mm -hmm. uh, shibboleths about this okay. uh, that are infecting the whole process. Mm -hmm. We have 
ethical issues yeah. that are set up in the medical profession that are creating issues. We have incentives True. in medicine mm -hmm. to, to extend life yeah. uh, rega regardless of yeah. the conditions. All of those you know, are, 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 are bad. But the criminalization yeah. issue, I think, is really difficult because that creates a stress yeah. in trying to deal with well, the problem mm -hmm. that shouldn't be there. I'm going to give you that point, and then I'm going to ask you what to do, because I'm going to tell you in the whole state of Oregon or Washington, it only affects about 100 people a year who make a legal request, and yet we have a population of 35 million people. And so I don't think, I, I think let's just give it up as an issue, because it's so socially divisive. And, and then I'm going to tell you we still have an enormous problem, and I'm going to ask you what we can do about it. Maybe we should have that conversation now, because, um, because, um, because, what about everybody else? There will be a few hundred people, perhaps, who take advantage of that in a year, but most of us want to live. For most people, even those who make that desperate cry, it's not really a desire for death, it's a cry for help. And so the question is, how can we help? Because that's what most of us are going to be doing, is crying for help. Um, so what are the policies that get beyond the divisiveness? What are the approaches we can take to, to craft solutions. And I do want to ask a question of our host. It's 6.50. So how long do we have to go? Sorry? We're good. We're going to 7. Okay, because, okay, well, I just want to be sensitive to everybody's time. So technically we're supposed to end in 10 minutes and this would make a good last question. <laughs> um, but if we're still having a great conversation, we can keep it going. So. Um, what do you think about my question to you? What are the answers? And I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. Well, I, still think, I don't think it's a giveaway. I mean, the fact okay. that only, I don't think it is either, only 40 but I'm going to give it to you. Only a 40 or, or, or out of 100 uh, do anything about it. Yes. The fact that they can do it makes the difference. It makes okay. the process easier. Okay. If, you've, if you actually have an outlet right. That isn't entirely illegal. Sure. You can work through this process, okay. and it and it's much more comfortable to do right. so. Okay. And that's that's my whole point on so all of this. Yeah. So it'll help a couple hundred people possibly in the state, it might help a but couple of million. in the uh, sense that they understand sure. okay. that they're not going to go to jail okay. just because they thought that maybe they wanted to die. Okay. To yes. I, yes. I think people want to know they have the option. None of us know what we'll feel like when we get there. <clears throat> but we want to know we have the option, and I think that's kind of what we have to think about. Okay. All right. I'll give you, I'll give you the, there's a certain self-actualization associated with knowing it. But what else? Yes. Because I think if the culture were able to say that, mm -hmm. it would have so many unintended consequences uh -huh. that we would be astounded. Okay. And Tell me about that. Who can tell us about it when we haven't been there? But, but mm -hmm. having that, it's illegal. Yeah. You can't go there by right. pure experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it changes your whole perspective on yeah. it. And if, we, if it were permission were given, uh -huh. that each of us has that mm. sacred choice, okay. then we'd all look at each other differently. Yeah. What would we do differently? It's so interesting. I just had my physical, and I have a cousin who's dying. Okay. So I was talking about her, but really mm -hmm. talking about me. And I asked this question, and I said to my doctor, okay, she wants to go to Holland. <laughs> and I suggested she go to Oregon. And he said, well, it's even really difficult in or Oregon. Mm -hmm. And he said, actually, what you really need is a great relationship with your doctor. Mm -hmm. And if you have a good relationship with your doctor, mm -hmm. he will help you if he's <coughs> of that mindset to help you do what you want to do, which is to end your life, which made me feel a whole hell of a lot better mm -hmm. with my doctor. Mm -hmm. But I do think maybe, I mean, is it just educating our, our physicians to say, help us and help the family? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe as a doctor you can answer this question, both of you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's sort of undercover that you give an extra few doses of medication, of morphine. I think the, the answer is, um, you're absolutely right, it has to do with relationship. And, and uh, this is in Oregon, but you don't, from my perspective as a cancer 
physician, um, we don't need to have a knockdown, drag out political fight over, over Oregon's um, legislation to do the right thing. And so, um, you know, consistent with what the Medical Board of California wants me to, you know, wants me to practice medicine, so I, you know, I do need to keep my license. But the fact of the matter is that, that I'm, I think we, we as cancer physicians can make it clear to patients that when they've decided enough is enough, um, we're not going to say, sorry, this isn't Oregon. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. And it's really, we, so much of the conversation has been, uh, been about cancer relation, you know, cancer sure. illnesses. My father died of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. He was sick for 10 years. Mm -hmm. He didn't speak for the last almost three years of his life. Um, and our tendency in this country is to warehouse these people. My mother kept my dad at home and did everything in her power to keep him mm -hmm. alive. Yeah. And it's a very different situation than I think in, in relation to cancer patients who really do seem to have more control, I think they do, over their end of life issues. Mm -hmm. But when that person can't speak, can't think, can't tell you, Again, hopefully you would have, I've had the conversation uh, about if it runs in the family, if I get in that position, you know, I'd love somebody to put a pillow over my head. Mm -hmm. But is it more difficult That's what we're with talking. if you're an Alzheimer, Alzheimer patient, mm -hmm. you have no quality of life, is you're what, not being treated. Yeah. Yeah. What is the it? Is it more difficult? What is the it? To end someone's mm -hmm. life. I mean, there's no quality of life, mm -hmm. and the numbers of, of dementia are rising every day. Right. Um, so that's, I'm yeah. kind of throwing that out, mm -hmm. you know. It's, um, so unquestionably, it's an agonizing issue. Um, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that the answer that we formulated here is a wider social policy that's gonna be embraced. So I, it may be an answer for Santa Barbara, but it's not going to fly in East LA. And it's not going to work in the Central Valley. Um, it's not going to work in Kansas. Um, so it's a, this is, I mean, I think we have to acknowledge that there are strong differences about this. And there are legitimate concerns about the way that it's carried out in places like the Netherlands. Um, I mean, especially when we're talking about people who have self-determination, it's one thing. When we start to talk about people who don't, it's quite another. And I think, um, Quality of life is a really dangerous thing to play with. I'll just tell you that um, research shows that living in a wheelchair is less tolerable before you have to live in a wheelchair than after you've been through it. And so um, there is a process of adaptation. We do learn to cope with certain disabilities. But I think that we have powerful tools for dealing with the problem that you're talking about, right? One of the most important is care planning. We think about these issues when, I mean, one important question is when does end of life care be, begin? And 85 to 90% of Americans say they wouldn't want a feeding tube when they have advanced dementia. But do you know what the proportion is in the state of California? You get it? It's over 40%. And I've got to tell you that it's more associated with for-profit nursing homes, okay? And, um, uh, and why? Because hospitals, uh, not hospitals, but well, gastroenterologists are reimbursed for procedures. Um, nursing homes are reimbursed at a higher rate um, for the skilled care that comes with the care of a feeding tube, and, um, and uh, nursing homes get a higher per diem rate for um, that care. So there are perverse incentives that work with our lack of care planning, but there are things that we can do proactively. So, um, so we do have to take matters into our own hands, but that doesn't mean a pillow. It means having these conversations and being proactive in the community when families are facing the problem early. And one of the things it implies, and I might ask our panelists, you could ask, answer this question, is when does end of life care begin? Um, I don't think it begins at birth, but if you have dementia and you want to, make a self, and you want to exercise your self-determination, it might begin close to the time when you have a diagnosis. So um, I, I don't think the answer is in a pillow, although that is, in fact, what the most recent movie on this subject implied. Um, I think that there are positive answers that avoid the pillow. And the, the question is, how do we exercise the broader 
tools that we have as a society so that, we, so that we don't get to the point where we feel like a pillow is the best health care we can afford. Yes. Okay. I don't know. Does our, does our, but I, I, I don't want my statement to be the last one. I, I would like to make one statement, and, and it's a pitch for both sides, both the medical side as well as us as consumers. We need to be informed. We need to continue educating ourselves, and we need to ask our physicians to partner with us, and we need to create advanced care directives. And they have to be informed advanced care directors. It's not just a, I do not want to be resuscitated. It's a lot more than that, and it's a lot more challenging. And the person who has cardiac disease versus the person who has cancer versus the person who has pulmonary disease or Alzheimer's are going to have different choices to think about. And it has to be done in partnership with their physician and their loved ones. Because when you can't make that decision, your loved ones are going to have to advocate for you because your physician may be on vacation that weekend and you're going to be cared for by the hospitalist and they have to be knowledgeable and informed and be willing to advocate for you. So we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, and, and I would like to add the, the loved ones piece of it has been mentioned slightly. I think Marcia mentioned it, others, but not enough. And we're focusing so much, this is where I'm coming from right now, focusing so much on the person who will be dying. But then we're all left behind. And I'm sure every one of us has had that experience. I did too. So that conversation needs to continue. Can you uh, have one pitch before we close? Do you want to talk, on that note, do you want to talk about the society? Yeah, the Society of Living and Dying Well and your day that comes up this in a couple of weeks? Go ahead. Sorry. That's all right. I didn't know. Great for you. Is this on? Okay. Um, to know that you've got this wonderful collaboration in this community that is addressing very much a lot of the issues you've been talking about this evening and at depth. We're engaged in a lot of public engagement um, and community conversations and providing opportunities for people to have those conversations with loved ones with a lot of support and facilitation. So what Fred's uh, referring to is that on November 13th, we're having a Get It Done Today uh, campaign and there's some cards out. I think Barbara, did you bring those out in the hallway where people are? Um, there are about eight locations in the community where you can come um, and receive one on one facilitation, bring your loved ones. Uh, we'll have notaries there, but this is to help you encourage everybody to complete or at least start your advanced health care directive in a context where you can have that kind of communication with family and. Um, and actually, I also want to just say that Cottage Hospital recently has developed a system now where we can bring our advanced care directives into the hospital and have them scanned in because accessibility is a big issue too, that when you, if and when you need them, they'll be there. And that's a wonderful, wonderful development. It'd be great for you all to know that. Um, so look, at the, there's going to be a lot of publicity of late, but there's going to be locations at Visiting Nurse and Hospice Care, Hospice of Santa Barbara, Sansom Clinic, Cottage Hospital, at multiple locations at different times during the day. It's totally free. There's refreshments. We really encourage you to take advantage of that. Thank you, Fred, for that opportunity. Thank you all for coming tonight. Yeah. Okay. And I want to thank Carl. Yeah. This was a very challenging topic, as we all know. So every one of you, I appreciate your being here. Stay tuned. We'll have another uh, trustees forum this spring. Carl, did you want to say a closing sentence? Just one? Well, um, <laughs> maybe just one sentence. Um, anyway, uh, thank you all for bearing well, with us on something that's really difficult. And I, I really, um, that last question was a hard one. That's a really hard one. And the reason it's so hard is because I think it's a sign of failure. I, I, I want us to leave by acknowledging that there's so many good alternatives. And one of the questions for all of us is that how do we make those alternatives available in this community and in other communities in the state so that, so that instead of desperation, that we know that our physicians, our whole healthcare team, um, and our families and community are all organized to make sure that instead of desperation, that we can have confidence not only in how the end is going to occur, but in the kind of support we have um, so that we can get the best possible care. And I think that's the assurance that we need to work for. 
So um, I don't want to avoid the question, but I, want to, I just want us to leave with a question of what can we do? And I'll tell you there's a lot we can do, so happy to talk more about it. Um, and I know that our panelists will too. But um, thank you very much for contributing those thank thoughts. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.